Ezra chapter 7, we'll start reading in verse 8. Here's what we read. Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia, and on the first day of the fifth month, so it took five months, he came to Jerusalem. For the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Let's give a little background on this. Uh, this week I received a couple of text messages as people were reading through Ezra, and the text messages all had to do with timing. They're like, well, when did this happen? And when did this happen? And sort of, you know, how long did this take? And, you know, that kind of thing. And people are, you guys are, we're just kind of processing the events of Israel's history. So let me just give a quick flyover so that everybody kind of knows where we're at, what's going on, and what's kind of happening simultaneously. The northern kingdom of Israel, the 10 tribes that are part of the northern kingdom that broke off from the rest of Israel, Judah, Jerusalem, in the time of Rehoboam, King David's grandson, those 10 tribes have now been completely defeated and carried off into Assyria and integrated into some other community over there. And there's been another group of people that's been transplanted into that territory in northern Palestine uh, at that time. Hundreds of years, actually about 100 years before 200 years before the events that we're reading. Judah, which is the southern kingdom, the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin who stayed true to King David's descendants on the throne in Jerusalem, have now also been defeated and carried off to Babylon, which you know right away that is modern day Iraq. And they've been in exile or captivity now for 70 years, about 70 years. And there's been these sort of waves of people coming back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the altar, to rebuild the walls. You know, all those kinds of things are going on. This is what's happening right now in Ezra. A few other things are going on. Prophets are speaking. Uh, Jeremiah has been on the scene. Jeremiah, who began his ministry there at the end of 2 Chronicles, right before Jerusalem was ransacked by Nebuchadnezzar and his army, carried off. Jeremiah began to prophesy, prophesy in his ministry, and he stayed in Jerusalem with the remnant, what's called the remnant of people that were left. They just left all the poor people in Israel. They took all the rich people, they took all the smart people, they took all the princes, they carried all them off, and they left all the poor people in uh, Israel, and, and Jeremiah stayed with them. And it was Jeremiah who prophesied that they would be in exile in Babylon for 70 years, and then the Lord would bring them back. Ezekiel began his ministry right around the same time. And Ezekiel, instead of staying with the remnant that was there in Jerusalem, Ezekiel was one of the ones that got carried off to Babylon. And so he, a lot of his ministry uh, happened when he was in Babylon. He saw some of the visions of God's throne and uh, things like that there in Babylon. He was one of the ones that prophesied that the temple would be rebuilt. And uh, you know, give some descriptions around that. Another guy that prophesied around this time was Daniel. Daniel was a young man carried off in the exile to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, ended up in Nebuchadnezzar's court with his three buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're there in Babylon serving the king, and Daniel begins to prophesy. And of course, he was, um, he not only prophesied that the Babylonian empire would be great, he also prophesied that it would be the Persians that would overtake the Babylonians and conquer Babylon. He went further and prophesied that Greece would rise to the occasion and conquer the Persians. And of course that happened. It's, it's, when we get to Daniel, this is pretty interesting stuff to read because he's naming Greece 
as the next empire. And then he'll, he describes a couple more empires that'll come on the world scene, but he doesn't give the name of them like he did with Persia and with Greece. And that makes for exciting Bible study uh, because it touches on some of the events that we're in today. So you have Daniel on the scene, there in Babylon. And you have Esther. Esther's story is going on right during that 70 years of them being in exile in Babylon and then kind of spread around uh, in Persia as well. Esther and Mordecai and that story going on. Then you have uh, this first group of people coming back to the land and we read in the beginning of Ezra, it was because of a man named Cyrus. Cyrus the Great, uh, who was the Persian emperor. He conquered Babylon and Uh, you know, and one of his first things he did was he made a decree that anybody that was an Israelite that wanted to go back to Jerusalem or go back to Israel, they were free to go. He issued that decree. Now, another prophet, Isaiah, came on the scene about 100 years before uh, Jerusalem was sacked, and he prophesied not only that it would be Babylon that would conquer Jerusalem, He also prophesied that a man named Cyrus would issue the decree that they would come back to Jerusalem. That's in Isaiah chapter 44 and 45. And just a little extra credit, since you're reading the Bible anyway, and this is interesting for you, uh, go ahead and read those two chapters, and you'll read some serious trash talking going on by God, just basically throwing it out there. I know the future and all your puny little gods do not. And so quit talking smack. This is where the worship belongs. It's right here because I tell the future from the past and the past from the future. And Cyrus is going to do this. So there you go. Isaiah 44 and 45. That won't be in the recap. So Cyrus comes on the scene and he issues this decree. And so this first wave of Israelites start coming back from Babylon to um, Jerusalem and they rebuild the altar. There's some trouble that happens. They have some trouble rebuilding the temple. There's some political problems. Um, You know, they're a small group and they end up getting the temple built. And then we get up to where we're at right now, which is Ezra, who is a priest or a scribe living in Babylon Uh, probably born there, we don't know, but he he ends up leading this huge group of people from Babylon back to Jerusalem, bringing a bunch of silver, a bunch of gold, a bunch of money, and a bunch of people to go and really reestablish the worship of God and to teach the people the law of the Lord. So this is what's happening right here, and he uses this phrase, He uses this phrase that the good hand of the Lord was on him. It's an interesting phrase because it gets repeated several times in Ezra and then it's also used in Nehemiah. So we'll read this this week. You'll see the couple of times where Nehemiah will say, hey man, the good hand of God was upon me, you know, when it came to this thing. Um, Look at how he uses it in verse nine. Look at it again. He says, Ezra 7, 9, he says, for on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia, and on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem, for the good hand of his God was on him. Now back up to verse six. Ezra chapter seven, verse six. We read, this Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given And the king granted him all that he asked for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. So it's the narrator, whoever is the the writer here is just describing, hey, this is what happened. And the reason that it happened was because the Lord had his hand on Ezra's life. So I have the question, well, did Ezra know that the hand of God was on him? Well, he did. Look at verse 27, Ezra chapter seven, verse 27. Ezra is talking and he's, he's praying or he's praising. And he says, Ezra seven twenty-seven. he says, blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing 
as this into the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. I took courage for the hand of the Lord my God was on me and I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. So what happened there? Well, notice it, notice what happens. Ezra realizes that the hand of the Lord is on him because of how the king responded to his request. What was his request? Well, it seems like he just went to the king and said, hey, I'd like to go to Jerusalem and teach the Bible. Teach the law of Moses to the people there so that they can worship God. That seems to be all he asked. And he got way more than permission. Not only did he get permission to go, but the king says, the king says to him, listen, yeah, yeah, you can go. You can take a bunch of people with you. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a bunch of stuff to take with you. I'll give you a bunch of silver and gold to take with you to worship the Lord. And I'll put you in charge of the whole area. How about that? I'll just make you in charge over there. So, you know, whatever it says in the law of the Lord and you teach it, man, just make that the law of the land over there. You can be in charge. And uh, whatever you're missing when it comes to like worshiping God over there, whatever you, just pull it out of my bank account because I got a bit over there and you know, you just have access to, here's my credit card. And so whatever you're missing, you know, use that. And just make sure you pray for me and my kids and for all these counselors. That's what I want you to do. So Ezra's kind of walking away going, did somebody get that? I, did, I, I thought I was going to get a no. <laughs> you know, no, you can't go. You got to stay. You're a scribe. We need you. We only have so many of you people, you know. And he got the royal treatment. No, man, go, go. So <laughs> Ezra's like, man, the Lord must be with us. And so he goes out. He's like, well, I got all this stuff, I, I should take some people. Let's go get some people. And so he says, let's do this, man. So we start to share, you know, hey, let's do this, let's do this. And they get into chapter eight and he runs into a problem. He gets the whole group together. He gets them all out of their houses and they're kinda, you know, they're kinda, have you ever packed for a big trip and you get everything in the car and then you get going down the road a little bit and then you're, you figure out you forgot something? Right, and you gotta make that decision of whether or not we're gonna go back or not, has that ever happened to you? Are we gonna go back or are we not gonna go back? Or like you, some people are smart, they figure this out and they get everything in the car and they plan the first stop is lunch, like an hour later, you know, or like, you know, we're gonna stop for a coffee at Tim Hortons and we're gonna start this trip right, you know, that kind of thing. And you get to Tim Hortons and then you realize, I left my wallet. Like, I, I need my wallet, you know? Do you have my passport? Where's my pa-? You know, like, you think about it. Well, this is kind of what happened to Ezra. They, they get everybody together. They're there by the thing, and he's going, all right, let's make sure we got everything because we're all, you know, from our houses now. And they're going through, and they realize this, we got no Levites. Like, we can't do this without these guys. Like, they are the only ones that have been picked by God as a tribe to, like, serve at the temple. Like, this is not gonna work without these guys. And it's not something that he can go back to the king with because what's the king gonna do? It's Levites, we need Levites. So he's got a problem. So he goes over to the chief of the Israelites there in Babylon, this guy named Ido, weird name. It's all right, it's his name. And they do this search and then we see the results. Ezra chapter eight Verse 18, read it with me. Ezra 8, 18, he says, and by the good hand of our God on us, they brought us a man of discretion of the sons of Mali, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, Israel, namely Sherebiah with his sons and kinsmen, 18 people. By the end of it, when you get down to the end of it, it all starts with this one guy, Sherebiah, that decided to come and then his sons decide to come, his kinsmen decide to come, this other guy decides to come, and by the end of it, he's got 258 guys from this one guy. And Ezra goes, obviously, the hand of the Lord is on us. This is fantastic. And then he realizes, I got another problem. I got another problem. What's the other problem? 
how are we gonna make this five month journey by foot with our families and our little kids and all this loot? (laughs) We are sitting ducks for any bandit, any marauders, Anybody that had a bad day in the Middle East with all their buddies, you know, just, you know, it's just in this real predicament. What if another army comes and starts to invade us? Like, and we're just, we're just sitting there and we've got a king's ransom among us. Oh my goodness, what a problem. Now here's another one. Couldn't go back to the king. Well, why couldn't he go back to the king? Well, you read it, chapter eight, verse 22. He says, I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way since we told the king, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. He shot his mouth off (laughs) to the king. He was just feeling the steadfast love of God and he was just like, I'll tell you what's gonna happen here, man, God's gonna protect us. And then he gets outside and he's like, well, I don't know if the Lord's gonna protect us with all this money. Oh my goodness. I wasn't expecting this, wasn't planning for this. And now we got all these people and I saw some of those kids and oh, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. We're not gonna be able to make this on a horse. We're gonna have to do this nine miles a day, five months. He said, oh man, we gotta pray. We gotta pray. We gotta pray. We gotta pray. Lord, will you protect us? Will you watch over us? Will your good hand be with us. We read the result down in verse 31. Then we departed from the river Ahava on the 12th day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambushes by the way. How did Ezra know that the good hand of the Lord was on him? He saw the evidence in his interaction with the king That's the earthly authority. He saw the evidence in his interaction with his peers, that was the Levites, and he saw the evidence in the protection of the Lord through dangerous circumstances, humanly impossible, dangerous journey. This is why we read back in chapter seven, verse eight, Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was the seventh year of the king, for on the first day of the first month he began to go up from Babylonia, and on the first day of the fifth month he came to Jerusalem, for the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and his rules in Israel. A great question to ask is, how do I know that the good hand of my God is on me? You remember Ezra's the one that said to the king, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him. And the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. How do I know that the good hand of the Lord is with me? Hebrews 11, chapter six, chapter 11, verse six says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him, who seek him. You say, Andy, how do I seek the Lord? Here's how you seek the Lord. You turn the direction of your life towards the Lord. Yeah, that's pretty simple. But here's the problem. All of us, all of us, me included, all the people that grew up in church, all the people that didn't grow up in church, all the people that grew up in good families, and all the people that didn't grow up in good families, everybody is self-seeking. They may look altruistic on the outside, 
But some of them have figured out that the best way to beat their needs is to help others. But still down deep, it's self-seeking. And at some point, you've got to come to that place in your life where you realize, you know what? I'm never going to be able to meet my own needs. And you turn the direction of your life, you basically tell yourself no. And you turn the direction of your life towards seeking the Lord, seeking his needs, seeking what is important to him, seeking his pleasure. And you ignore yourself, you reject yourself. The crazy thing is, is that when you do that, he meets your needs. And you're sort of overflowing from that point on. But everybody has to make that decision to now seek the Lord. This is what Ezra is talking about. He's talking about it. You wanna hear something amazing? You know, to join, so, so if you're gonna seek the Lord, not only are you gonna seek his presence, not only are you gonna seek, you know, to do things that he likes, but you're also really like Ezra, who set his heart to seek the Lord. He, in seeking the Lord, was reading the Bible and seeing, oh man, this is what God wants to do. I can see what God wants to do. And if I join this, man, he's gonna be really happy that I'm gonna join his plan, seeking the Lord. You wanna hear something incredible? Fast forward in the timeline from Ezra's day, May 14th, 1948. Harry Truman is the President of the United States and the State Department and his generals are having meetings with him. And they're telling him, whatever you do, do not Stick your head out there and recognize the state of Israel. Wait till all the chips fall. You know what Truman did? Left the meeting, turned around, sent out the memo. No, 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 let's recognize the state of Israel. Let's do it before Russia does it. Let's move this thing on. 1948. About five years later, November 1953, a few, months, a few months after leaving the presidency, he was brought, this is Truman, he was brought to the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York to meet a bunch of Jewish dignitaries. And his buddy, Eddie Jacobson, introduces him to the assembled theologians and says, quote, this is the man who helped create the state of Israel, end quote. Truman piped up and said, what do you mean, help to create? I am Cyrus. I'm Cyrus. Oh, what's the point? Here's a guy that knew the Bible and knew what God wanted to do. Now, did God want to create the state of Israel? Well, that's, that's a big discussion. <laughs> that's a big discussion. Not everything that they've done has been fantastic. But God has decided that he is going to bring back all the Israelites to the land of Israel. It may not be under the state of Israel that we know it, but that was something that God wanted to do. And Harry Truman, because he believed that that's what God wanted to do, he joined in the work of God in that. Listen, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel all prophesied, not only about the Israelites and their exile, not only about them coming back to the land in Ezra's day and Nehemiah's day, not only about the rebuilding of the wall, not only about the rebuilding of the temple and the rebuilding of the altar and the restoring of worship, but they also prophesied about the first coming of the Messiah, Jesus. And they prophesied two times as much material about the second coming of the Messiah when he's going to return. If you want to see evidence of the good hand of God on your life, tonight's the night. Stop seeking after yourself. 
and your needs. Listen, I know your needs are shouting at you. And they're saying, listen, we need, we need, we need, we need, we need. It's relentless. But if you'll turn and tell them no and begin to just seek the Lord and what he wants to do and where he's at and what he's about, I'm telling you, the truth, he meets needs. He meets needs. He so satisfies our, lo- our, our lives with the things that we really need. Well, what are the things that we really need? Love, joy, peace. It's not that you need a new job. You need peace. It's not that you need the recognition of your education or some of these things. What you need is you need love. It's not that you need to get married. You're looking for joy. These are the things that are actually meeting the needs down inside of your heart and down inside of your life. And now you're not desperate anymore, clamoring after whatever trickle of water that you could find. Hey, we were meant to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. We were meant to be in relationship with God. That's what life is all about. And man, does he ever meet needs. He meets needs. What did that look like for Ezra? To seek the Lord, to jump into his will, to do what he's doing. Here's what it looked like, verse 10, chapter seven. Here's what it looked like for Ezra, practically, practically. Here's what it looked like for him. It says, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it. And to teach his statutes and his rules in Israel. What does that look like for you? What does it look like for you? Well, I can tell you it's not going to look the same. It's going to look a little bit different. It's going to look a little different because we're not, we're not living in Ezra's day. Someone much greater than Ezra has showed up on the scene. And his name is Jesus. And not only did he teach the law of the Lord to anybody that wanted to listen, he lived it out perfectly. And then he offered himself and his life, his acceptance before God, he offered it to anybody that wanted to receive it. Well, how did he do that? Well, he denied himself. He said no to himself and offered himself on the cross of Calvary as a sacrifice for anybody that wanted to enter into the favor and the blessing of God that he had on his life. He offered an exchange. I will take all of the wrath, all of the punishment of everything that you've done wrong, I'll take that on myself and I will give you all of my acceptance, all of my blessing, all of my privilege, I'll give that to you. Well, what do you have to do? Well, you have to do exactly what we were talking about earlier. You have to turn the direction of your life away from self towards the Lord. That's exactly what he did. That's exactly what we're gonna do. That's how you become a Christian. Is now you're no longer seeking after self, but you're seeking after Jesus Christ. You're seeking after the Lord. You know, once you do that, the good hand of the Lord never leaves your life. The good hand of God is on your life, not because of what you do right or what you do wrong or whether you missed it or whether you didn't miss it. You know, the good hand of God on your life is there because of what Jesus did on the cross. You may not see the evidence of that, but it's there. Ezra never would have seen the evidence of God's good hand on his life unless he had gone in a step of faith to talk to the king, talk to the chief, to pray, and then to just step out by faith on that five-month journey that God had given him to do. Then he saw the hand of God. Sometimes we have to take steps of faith. Sometimes we have to take risks. But the joy in life is seeking the Lord. Is seeking the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Ezra. Thank you for his example. Thank you, Lord, for recording these things in the scriptures for us to read and to see and to study today. 
and the hope that it gives us and the encouragement that it gives us. That, Lord, that you're with us. You're opening doors no man can shut and you're shutting doors that no man can open. Lord, you're requiring of us faith. And Lord, for us to stop seeking ourselves and begin to seek you and to your, seek your kingdom. Lord, for some of us here tonight, we've never made that decision. And Lord, we're living in the captivity of our own desires. Father, I pray for everybody here tonight listening that is in that position hungry and eating but never being full, thirsty and drinking but never being satisfied. Lord, I pray they'd have the courage and the wisdom, Lord, to tell themselves no, deny themselves, and Lord, turn and begin to seek you. Lord, for those of us that have made that decision in the past and have tasted the good fruit of knowing you and of seeking you, And Lord, for whatever reason, we've gotten distracted and off the path and back into that hamster wheel of trying to meet our own needs, trying to satiate some of these desires. Lord, may we have the wisdom and the courage to come back to you and to seeking you, to worshiping you, living a life that pleases you, putting your priorities above our own, And Lord, for those of us that are standing outside the door of the king's house, and we got a big request, pretty sure that the earthly authority is gonna say no. Lord, would you give us courage? Would you give us faith? Lord, to go and to boldly ask and to share. Lord, the vision that you've given us. Some of us are afraid to share it with peers. Some of us are just standing there on the riverside just missing what we need and Lord need to ask. And Father, some of us just need plain, outright courage to take the step of faith and begin the journey that you've called us to make. Trust in you to lead, to guide, to provide, and to protect. Lord, you're good. You're a good father. And Lord, we see the prophecies that you're coming and you're coming very soon. And we pray, Maranatha, may it even be tonight. We long to see you face to face. There's nothing more exciting, nothing more that we desire that could happen tonight than for you to return. Fill us afresh with your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Created to serve, created to worship you. My heart just keeps on throbbing with your passion inside me. And I stand in the other life you've given.